the tradition of the great British novel is as popular today as it's ever been. And since the first novelists put Quill to parchment, the beautiful rural landscape has proved to be a major source of inspiration. Whether that happens to be the Hampshire countryside of Jane Austen, the Kent of Charles Dickens, the wild Yorkshire moors of the Bronte sisters, the Nottinghamshire of D.H. Lawrence, or the ancient Wessex of Thomas Hardy, each location speaks volumes. I'm Liam Dale, and if you'd like to join me, I'd be delighted to introduce you to the Warwickshire of George Eliot. As birthplaces go, I must say South Farm is one of the loveliest I've ever seen. And in the very heart of the Warwickshire countryside, you just couldn't ask for a more idyllic location. It was here on the 22nd of November 1819 that Mary Ann Evans, perhaps the most successful novelist of her generation, was born. And if you're wondering why that name doesn't sound terribly familiar, it's probably because you know her much better by her nom de plume, George Eliot. The reason for so little changing here since the author responsible for such classics as The Mill on the Floss, Silas Marner and Middlemarch was born is the fact that it's part of the Arbury Estate, where traditional rural values are as respected today as they've ever been. South Farm by custom is the home of the estate manager, and back in 1819 the position and the house were in the possession of Mr Robert Evans, George Eliot's father. Although the Evans family and their new addition were only at South Farm for about four months, Arbury was to have a huge impact on George Eliot, as Robert Evans continued to look after the estate for the Newdegate family. And if you'd like to come with me the short distance to Arbury Hall, you'll see for yourself why the big house made such a lasting impression. Welcome to Arbury Hall, the ancestral home of Viscount and Viscountess Daventry, where George Eliot, thanks to her father's high-ranking position in this household, was permitted to use the extensive library. Now, even as a small girl, she was a voracious reader, and at the age of seven was a fan of Sir Walter Scott's Waverley, not to mention the works of Bunyan, Defoe and Goldsmith. Although the hall is Elizabethan in origin, Building work in the 18th century transformed it into one of the finest examples of Gothic revival you're ever likely to see. And if we go inside, there are more Arbury treasures to reveal. One of the most striking features of this house has to be the soaring fan vaults with filigree tracery. It must have been truly mesmerising for a small child. In one of George Eliot's less well-known works, Mr Gilfill's Love Story, from Scenes of Clerical Life, she describes carved ceilings that looked like petrified lacework in a house called Cheverell Manor. And I'm sure you'll agree with me when I say that there can be no doubt where she took her inspiration from. Nevertheless, Mary Ann Evans had a very long way to go before she wrote this delightful tale. And to discover more about George Eliot's own fascinating story, it's time to head to a nearby hostelry, which just happens to have been an equally important source of inspiration for George Eliot the writer as Arbury Hall, being the house that the Evans family moved to when she was still a babe in arms all those years ago. <laughs> 
Now, when Robert Evans brought his family here to live at Griff House, needless to say, it wasn't a pub or even a hotel back then. And this is the place that George Eliot called home while she was growing up. Robert Evans had two children by his first wife, who had died in 1809, and two with his second wife, Christina, before she gave birth to Mary Ann in 1819. The closest in age to our future author was her brother Isaac, who she adored, and the pair spent many happy hours together in the countryside around Griff House and on the Arbury estate. And although George Eliot would become a city dweller as an adult, she would never forget her rural roots, which are at the very heart of her greatest novels. In fact, in The Mill on the Floss, the characters of Maggie Tulliver and her brother Tom are without question autobiographical, with Tom always scolding Maggie for her wayward behaviour, something that Isaac would take to the extreme in later years. We've now come right to the top of Griff House to discover a very special place, and I must confess to being really excited about being here. This attic, with its low beams, is the place where the burgeoning George Eliot loved best. It was her sanctuary. And when she describes young Maggie Tulliver fleeing to the attic when she's in trouble with Tom for not feeding his rabbits, again, just as at Arbury Hall, we're left in no doubt whatsoever as to where the inspiration came from. Maggie stood motionless, except from her sobs for a minute or two, then she turned round and ran into the house and up to her attic, where she sat on the floor and laid her head against the worm-eaten shelf with a crushing sense of memory. Tom was come home, and she had thought how happy she should be, and now he was cruel to her. What use was anything if Tom didn't love her? Oh, he was very cruel. <laughs> If you're thinking that Griff House looks nothing like a mill, you'd be quite correct, because we've come to a remarkable mill at Chalcot, also in Warwickshire, which is one of the few fully working traditional flour mills you'll find in Britain today. George Eliot actually based the Dalcote mill of her novel at St Ogg's in Lincolnshire. But to see what she actually had in mind today, reading her evocative words, I hope you'll agree, Chalcot fits the bill perfectly. Maggie loved to linger in the great spaces of the mill and often came out with her black hair powdered to a soft whiteness that made her dark eyes flash out with new fire. The resolute din, the unresting motion of the great stones, giving her a dim, delicious awe as at the presence of an uncontrollable force, the meal forever pouring, pouring. The fine white powder softening all surfaces and making the very spider nets look like fairy lacework. The sweet, pure scent of meal all helped to make Maggie feel that the mill was a little world apart from her outside everyday life. The old country ways that have been so beautifully described in this novel paint a vivid picture of 19th century rural life, but there are those who view the work of George Eliot as rather serious. Yet her observations of the good country folk who would later become her cast of background characters add a wonderful touch of humour. Unlike her contemporary Charles Dickens, there's nothing sentimental in George Eliot's portrayal of either the people or the landscapes that inspired her. We do also get a glimpse of other members of her family through these characters, and again in The Mill on the Floss, when Mrs Tulliver's sisters arrive, who we know are based on the sisters of Christina Evans, our author's aunts, the humour is evident. The well-to-do sisters are quick to voice their opinions, while deciding whether to buy teapots and table linen should there be a bankruptcy sale, as the Tullivers have fallen upon such hard times. Despite the tragic circumstances, their endearing bossiness is presented with wit and irony, as they gather at the mill to dispense advice when Mr Tulliver is sick and the family face ruin. <laughs> 
Sister Glegg is determined to be heard. It's for your own good I say this, for it's right you should feel what your state is, and what disgrace your husband's brought on your own family, as you've got to look for everything and be humble in your mind. Mrs. Glegg paused, for speaking with much energy for the good of others is naturally exhausting. For now, though, we'll leave the aunts at Charlcote Mill and return to Griff House to hear more about George Eliot's fascinating childhood. In the Mill on the Floss, Maggie is keen to be educated, but as was often the case in Victorian England, all the money was lavished on Tom as a boy, although Maggie is much brighter and would undoubtedly have made better use of the opportunity. However, this part of the tale is not autobiographical, because Mary Ann Evans received a very good education and excelled in her studies, until returning to Griff House at the age of 16 to help care for her dying mother. Mrs Evans died in 1836 and is buried in the family tomb at nearby Chilvers Coton. The harrowing experience had a huge impact on Mary Ann. She developed an obsessive religious fervour, studying church history and even teaching herself Latin. But other influences were about to transform this rather puritanical young lady into a passionate, worldly wise woman way ahead of her time. And if you want to know more, you'll have to join me again in just a few minutes. Robert Evans retired from his duties at Arbury Hall, and as Isaac Evans was just about to marry, he remained at Griff House, keeping this lovely property in the family. Mary Ann and her father moved to nearby Coventry, and for Robert and Isaac, this was when the hitherto biddable Miss Evans started to become troublesome, flexing her intellectual muscle, having made new friends who were radical thinkers. While Isaac remained the respectable countryman here at Griff, the reactionary Mary Ann turned her back on religion and began to follow where her heart and mind led her. When Robert Evans died in 1849, she actually asked, What shall I be without my father? It will seem as if part of my moral nature was gone. And it wasn't long before Mary Ann's excellent education and early writing skills threw her into the path of temptation, as this evidently passionate, courageous young woman found her own way of coping with the restraints of Victorian society. Actually, Robert Evans would have turned in his grave, well, to be more accurate, in the family tomb here at Chilvers Coton Churchyard, if he could have seen his daughter's headstrong ways. And even brother Isaac could do nothing to keep his sister in check once she'd moved to London. This all came about because while she was still living in Coventry, she'd taken over a translation project for one of her radical friends who was struggling with the task. The work Das Leben Jesu, ironically, The Life of Christ, was indeed challenging and took Mary Ann two years to complete. However, although she remained anonymous, the publisher, John Chapman, was so delighted with the work, he sought out its translator. And shortening her name to Marion, Ms Evans moved to Chapman's boarding house at 142 The Strand, where she began her literary career. Although we can only speculate, it would seem that the dashingly handsome Chapman took more than a professional interest in his young lodger. And she apparently was not averse to his attentions. It was already an unusual household, and when Chapman's wife and his mistress, who also lived in the house, joined forces to have Marion removed, she was quite literally sent to Coventry, back home to Warwickshire. The exile was short-lived though, as Chapman bought the Westminster Review, a journal for philosophical radicals, and Marion was promptly restored to her position in the house on the Strand to run the publication. Undaunted in her quest to find love, and at the very heart of literary society, Marion soon developed a relationship with Herbert Spencer, the editor of The Economist. 
Sadly for her though, he described her as too morbidly intellectual to marry. Marion's infatuation with Spencer was only quelled when he introduced her to his friend George Henry Lewis, a fellow philosopher and writer. The pair quickly fell in love and Spencer happily remained a confirmed bachelor for the rest of his days. But there was a problem. George Lewis was married, albeit an unusual open relationship. His wife Agnes had given him three sons, but had also had further children with another man, who Lewis had given his name to, making a divorce all but impossible, as he'd been seen to condone his wife's infidelity. As a result, Marion also took the Lewis name, and the couple lived together as man and wife, but at a distance from even the more liberal-minded literary circle that they both moved in. It was at this point that Marion, with the encouragement of Lewis, turned her attention to novel writing, choosing George Eliot as a masculine pen name, not only to court publishing success, but also perhaps to disguise her somewhat dubious marital status. Nevertheless, it was not the elite intellectuals of London society that Marion turned to for inspiration. It was the beautiful Warwickshire countryside of her childhood. And if you come with me now to the lovely church of St Mary the Virgin in the village of Astley, you'll certainly understand why. George Eliot's first success as a storyteller came with the publication of her Scenes of Clerical Life in Blackwood's magazine. This church appears as Nebley Church and is actually where her parents were married. The reviews were excellent when her scenes of clerical life were published in book form and encouraged she began work on Adam Bede, which received even greater acclaim. Queen Victoria and Prince Albert were said to have enjoyed the novel greatly, adding to George Eliot's growing popularity. However, Drawing on childhood memories like this beautiful church, there was one person who was quick to identify George Eliot, and that was, of course, Marion's brother, Isaac. The Evans family was scandalised by Marion's relationship with George Lewis and shunned her completely, making it impossible for her to even visit the places that had now made her so famous. Yet for the world of literature, this was one cloud that very definitely had a silver lining. And as we return to Charlcote Mill, all will be revealed. Without a doubt, the most influential person in Marion's childhood had been her brother Isaac. And with her identity no longer a secret, in her next novel, The Mill on the Floss, she was now free to write about this complex relationship. The hugely autobiographical work was another success, critically and financially, and Mr and Mrs Lewis moved up in the world. In London, they were no longer social outcasts, and Marion moved into a new phase of her writing career. It was as if she had exorcised her demons, and when Silas Marner was published in 1861, her readers discovered a much gentler side to George Eliot, when the miserly weaver of Ravelow discovers that love is far greater than riches when it comes to finding happiness. Despite a brief defection to a new publisher with the unsuccessful Romola, a historic tale of Italy which Blackwood had felt would not be well received, George Eliot returned to Matters English and the astute Blackwood with the novel Felix Holt in 1830. Even so, it failed to capture the public imagination. But her next work, Middlemarch, published in 1871, proved to be George Eliot's masterpiece. Her readers were mesmerised by the goings-on in the town being transformed by the Industrial Revolution, based on the author's memories of Coventry, and they eagerly waited for her next novel, her last, Daniel Deronda, in 1876. It was a brave work, discrediting anti-Semitism, but was not as popular with the Victorians as Middlemarch had been. But as memories of her Warwickshire past still coloured George Eliot's literary offerings, London life for Marion, in the grand Regent's Park house she now shared with her beloved Lewis, suddenly changed dramatically. In 1878, George Lewis developed cancer 
and died on the 30th of November at the age of 61. Marion was devastated, and when he was buried in Highgate Cemetery, she was too overcome with grief to attend his funeral. Nevertheless, as she recovered, she started to become close to her financial advisor, John Cross, who she and Lewis had always referred to as Nephew Johnny. He was 20 years her junior, but evidently saw something that appealed to him in the 60-year-old author, because they were married in 1880 and in December moved into the very stylish Four Cheney Walk in Chelsea. We do have one clue, however, to the mysterious allure of George Eliot, as after the young American writer Henry James had met her, he described her in a way that she may not altogether have seen as a compliment. To begin with, she is magnificently ugly, deliciously hideous. She has a low forehead, dull grey eye, vast pendulous nose, and a mouth full of uneven teeth. Now, in this vast ugliness, there is a powerful beauty, so that you end as I ended, falling in love with this great horse-faced blue stocking. Sadly though, the new and now respectfully married Mrs Cross was not destined to find happiness with her new husband at Cheney Walk, falling ill with laryngitis soon after moving in, and her condition deteriorated rapidly. She died very suddenly on the 22nd of December 1880 with John Cross at her side. Although he tried to have his famous wife buried in Westminster Abbey's Poets' Corner, the religious establishment turned the mortal remains of George Eliot away because of her relationship with George Lewis, and she was instead buried next to the man she had considered her husband, even though the church did not for so many years, in Highgate Cemetery. Ironically, one of the mourners at her funeral was none other than Isaac Evans, who had become reconciled with his sister after her marriage to John Cross. And it's sad that George Eliot did not live long enough to return home to Warwickshire to revisit the places that inspired her to become one of literature's greatest novelists. But it's not in London that we should bid farewell to this extraordinary woman who was so far ahead of her time. The only proper place we should take our leave is back once more in the heart of George Eliot country, as she said herself, in Middlemarch. Little details gave each field a particular physiognomy, dear to the eyes that have looked on them from childhood. Proving beyond all doubt that despite so often being mistaken for a man, George Eliot was indeed a woman of vision, sustained her whole life long by memories of this remarkable landscape.